Conviction is brought to you by Three Rings Circus Productions. The links to our valued sponsors and all the show notes from this podcast, please visit our website, threeringscircus.com.au. This is the true story of Craig Gouzet. In the mid-1990s in Sydney, Australia, Craig was living the idyllic Australian lifestyle. He and his wife Lisa had settled in the sleepy beachside suburb of Avalon with their three children, Jessica, Kylie and Tim. Craig was an active member of the community and a captain of the local surf boat crew. However, he had another life a secret life that none of his friends or acquaintances knew about, and his close family had little knowledge. Craig was an undercover cop. In this podcast, we are taken into the secret world of police surveillance as Craig explains the behind-the-scenes investigations and the arrests of some of Australia's most infamous criminals. Craig's journey takes us into the belly of Sydney's underworld and headlong into a clandestine club of crooked cops. He will also be confronted by every parent's nightmare as an unexpected discovery upturns his family life. This is a story of tragedy, triumph, danger, and above all, conviction. We pick up the story in the autumn of 1996. Craig is finishing a routine investigation into an attempted murder. He doesn't know it yet, but he is about to begin five years of equal parts success, adventure and tragedy. Yeah, back in about 1996, I was attached to what was called the uh, District Anti-Theft Squad, which we mainly dealt in theft and everything, but... Due to our uh, presence with current, uh, I suppose, situations in in the area, we got put on a lot of different jobs. And I remember, you know, every day was different. You'd walk into the office, which we had a uh, covert office in the local shopping centre, um, hidden away from the police station, so no one knew we were actually police. We were plain clothes and board shorts, etc. But you'd go into the office and and you'd get assigned either your, your duties for the day, or it could go on for a month if you were put onto a a task force, but this particular morning I went in, there'd just been a shooting. A property developer had fallen foul of his disgruntled builder. So myself and three others were assigned to uh, look into the shooting for the detectives. What had happened was weeks before, he had had his uh, dog killed and hung up at the front door. He'd had his car firebombed. And lo and behold, the last one was he came home on a very dark night pulled into his driveway, the usual thing he'd do, into his uh, garage and getting out of the car. All of a sudden, from in the darkness and the shadows of the back of the garage, came a hitman. Shot him straight through the mouth. Hitman thinking, of course, that you'd, you'd kill the guy, and uh, he took off. The sound of the gunfight shot uh, you know, disturbed the, the family inside, which was his wife and, and children who came out and to find that their husband and father was uh, there lying, bleeding profusely through the head. And the story behind it, I suppose, was that this guy was taking a builder to court over one of his developments that had gone wrong, and um, hence you know, the dog being hung and the, the car being firebombed was a bit of a warning that if you want to keep going with this, this is the sort of action we're going to take. And uh, he was kept, kept going with the court action, and this last thing was meant to be the end of him. But uh, luckily... The bullet actually ricocheted through his jaw and came out through the other side of his mouth. It didn't kill him. He had some massive, massive uh, injuries through his head and recovered. And obviously the number one suspect was the builder who was taken, who was taken to court. And that, uh, yeah, that went for three or four weeks and, until obviously finished that and did all our surveillance reports, etc. Came back to the office and the rest of the office, there was probably 11 of us in the office at, at that time. They'd already been assigned to another job, which was uh, codenamed the North Shore Rapist. In 1995, a serial rapist began a reign of terror on the North Shore of Sydney. 
over a period of 12 months, peaking in May 1996, when in just over three weeks, he stalked and raped two women and a teenager. Women in this area of Sydney came to live in fear of the North Shore Rapist. There are countless court records and victim statements of his sexual attacks and the traumatizing effects on his victims. What you're about to hear for the first time is the story behind the surveillance and capture of this evil criminal. A guy had been raping women for uh, probably about a 12 month period. Very spasmodic in uh, that it wasn't continue, it was every month and a half, two months. The thing was his MO was the same. They uh, had been able to get a couple of DNA samples from semen that he'd left with women. He'd basically uh, follow women mainly back to unit blocks and a lot of them were security unit blocks and just before they went in he'd grab them. He was hooded, he had sunglasses, he had a knife. He'd take the women then straight downstairs threatening them with the knife and uh, he'd sexually assault them down in the car park. Some was full penetration, as I said, there were samples there from his DNA, and others were uh, just head jobs. He was uh, described as being very cold and callous. He had the knife up to their neck a lot of the time, and uh, this was the type of person we were set to look for. I'd missed the first week of this operation and the detectives had given our crew a briefing, which I found out about later on and was updated, but initially we had targeted two other people. The first one was actually a chef over at North Sydney, but once the, uh, the rest of the crew had followed him for a while, we realised it wasn't him, the hours that he was working. His mannerisms, his size uh, and everything else didn't fit the profile. They also looked at someone over from the Newtown area that fitted the profile and again with a bit of uh, researching into his background and everything, again no, it all came to nothing. The next step was that the detectives in charge, who was the, the North Region Major Crime Squad, they decided to get all the victims in and do a Penry photograph. A Penry photograph involves a portrait reconstruction using multiple combinations of frontal and profile images. The women who had been in close proximity and, and had seen part of the, the face um, managed to get a pretty good penry together, enough that when they put it out in the papers, it was quite interesting the response that the police got. There was hundreds and hundreds, obviously, who called back after it was put through the papers, but there was two particular bits of information that led us to what I describe as probably one of the best investigations because it's not often you actually find a predator who is still preying on women and uh, to the extent that this guy was. The Penry photo, as it came out, we got a first call and uh, it was a guy from a printing company over in Redfern. And he said, look, I don't know if I'm on the right trail here, but this photo represents a person who works in our factory. Uh, it is so close, it's unbelievable. And he gave us the name of the, the person that worked there. The same day, a female from Gordon contacted the office. And she had some remarkable information that she'd actually been followed by a male fitting this description. He'd followed her from the train station all the way back to her unit block. She felt his presence and as she walked faster, he walked faster. She got within probably about 20 metres of the front entrance of her unit block and turned around and in a loud pitched voice said, fuck off! And the guy just stopped, froze. She ran into the unit block and he never got her. She was just that petrified, she stood at the front of her window and inside the unit block not knowing what to do. She watched this guy go back to the car, he'd parked it near the railway station, got in the car and had the hide to come and cruise past her unit block. And to her, I suppose, uh, marvel, you might say, she had the ability to see his number plate and took it down, wrote it on a post-it note and stuck it on the fridge, never reported the matter. And this had been some months prior. 
and after seeing this penury, she rang the police and gave us this exact information with the car number. Detectives got extremely excited when this car number matched the same as his factory worker over in Redfern in the printing factory. So this was virtually the same day that I joined the operation and our first day over there was at Redfern. And we started at about two o'clock because we knew his hours were seven till three. We'd already done transport checks and knew every vehicle that he owned. He only owned one, which was good. It was a sedan. From memory, it was a silver Ford Fairlane. And there it was parked in the uh, factory car park. So uh, we commenced surveillance. And from that day, this was our man we knew. He went straight out, straight at three o'clock at work, straight down towards Ultimo and Glebe. We'd already known a number of places that he went to, and it was around universities, it was around the inner city, it was around Epping Railway Station, North Shore Railway Stations. This is where most of the attempt rapes or rapes took place. And from day one, as I said, he was straight out. We followed him. He'd see a young lady walk out of a railway station or from a bus stop and he'd stalk them in his car. Not every time, you know, he did anything. He'd just stalk them and follow them slowly. Three o'clock till usually about 7, 7.30, he'd be doing this three to four hours every afternoon. He lived out at Kenters. We'd follow him out there after he'd done his stalking. And every day we were just waiting for him to do something. His uh, mannerisms, he had a cold face. It was exactly like they had described the victims. He was about six foot, and after doing a bit of research on him, he had recently separated from his wife. He uh, had two young boys in their teens. And he'd met a young lady, much younger than him. And from memory, he was actually engaged to her and living in a granny flat at the back of her parents' place. He would get home, I suppose, on average, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night for dinner, and uh, would make sure he's well and truly you know, in bed, and then would, would leave and uh, start again at 2 o'clock the next day. This went on and on and on, and watching this guy was actually sickening. And to know that uh, back in those days we, we weren't able to arrest him, we didn't have the ability due to the law that we couldn't just go and grab him and get a DNA sample. We actually had to wait for him to do something. And that was a sickening thing, knowing that there was another victim out there that was possibly going to get attacked. We were there hopefully to prevent that. During the month-long surveillance of his prime suspect, Craig returned every night to wife Lisa and his three children. This was Haven, a place where he could switch off. Yeah, at the time I was at the Special Operations Group. I was living close by, you know, only about 20 minutes from work, which was handy. I was living in a little place called Avalon Beach on the northern beaches of Sydney. A little surfing community, I suppose you'd call it. I uh, was your average family man. I married with the wife, Lisa. I had three kids at this stage. I had uh, Jessica, who was about six, uh, Tim, who was four, and Kylie, who was two. Um, these guys were too young to really understand what I was doing. They, they knew I was in the police but didn't know at that age what the police were doing. And this job did have one advantage in that I virtually worked a permanent afternoon shift. So I managed to get home by 11 o'clock at night and was able to spend all day with the kids and if Lisa was off work, we were able to go and do things. So in comparison to the previous job uh, with the bloke that was shot through the face, you know, we were working long, long hours there. Even though this was long, um, in the afternoons, it was just like a normal shift and it did give me the opportunity then just to, to be with the kids during the day. My family really didn't understand or didn't know what I was doing. I didn't go home and explain things. Um, sometimes Lisa would, would have a bit of an understanding on the job, but after a while, they, um, they would just be nonchalant about it all. I'd always come home in different cars. That was always amusing for the kids. I'd sometimes have old Sandman panel vans with bean bags in the back and sometimes you'd have four-wheel drives. So it was always different for them, And but they never asked questions. They'd just see the new car and jump in and have a bit of fun. It was like a little uh, cubby house, I suppose, some of the surveillance vans we had. Weekends were just a normal weekend. I used to be in the surf club and I rode surf boats at the time. Uh, I'd been in the surf club for years. 
loved uh, the fitness side of, of the rowing. It was a fantastic sport to do. So that was my summer, and I used to play rugby league and rugby union during the winter on the weekends. Uh, even at this stage, I think I was 30-something still playing. Just love sport. Uh, kids used to always come to everything. And, uh, yeah, we engaged them in different things as well. Jesse was doing ballet. Tim started playing uh, rugby league at an early age. And... Um, Kylie was way too young to be doing anything apart from being a little girl. However, this idyllic family life was soon to be shattered in a way that no one could have expected. The events that we cover in the upcoming episodes will take Craig to the depths of despair, the remote wilderness of the Australian outback and to the steps of Parliament House. Right now, he's focused on the North Shore Rapist. By this stage, we had collated enough evidence over two weeks of his antics and what he was doing, which matched into the MO, and we applied for a su Supreme Court warrant to not only get a listening device, but be able to put a tracking device on his car. This would help us in case we did lose him and uh, for some period of time that we could trace him. We also had put in the idea that we use one of our undercover operatives, a female, to uh, dress in the appropriate attire that would attract him and uh, put her in a position where she walked out of a train station or something in front of him that at least then we had a police officer who would be approached and uh, probably touched uh, with us close by and we could go from there. So these things were put into place but uh, they take a while to organise and they're not the easiest things to do. Putting a listening device in a car or putting a tracking device in a car took time. While we had the uh, application into the Supreme Court warrant going, uh, he did actually approach a woman and it was around the Glebe area, um, just the inner city. We'd followed him, his normal antics, and again, we we're on the edge of our seat the whole time. This wasn't just a normal follow. Seeing him when he actually did see a woman, we thought this could be it. And on this particular day, he did see a woman and showed a bit more interest than normal. And again, you know, the, the, the call through our cars was heads up, here we go, he, he's going to go. He'd thrown his hoodie on, which gave us a bit of a, an idea that he was going to get out and approach this woman. So he threw his hoodie on and threw the car into a car spot, followed her down through like a park that led down to these units. We had two of our operatives jump out, dump their cars and follow him close by. The lady uh, was walking probably about 10 metres in front of him and luckily for her had just got into a security block and he was metres behind at the time and the door shut. She didn't look behind to let him in or do anything. He just stood at the door watching this lady then disappear into the unit block and up a set of stairs and gone. Our operatives just pulled off to the side without him noticing them. And this happened on two occasions. And you can imagine as police officers, we've been working on this guy for a couple of weeks now and we're itching to arrest him before something happened. And again, it didn't. Our warrants did come through. We got approval through the courts to put a listening device in. I still remember the day that we did it. It was a weekend. He'd uh, gone down to Long Reef from Kenthurst where he lived, out, which is probably about a 30 kilometre drive onto the, the coast. He came from the Northern Beaches originally, so he, he did surf. It was a perfect opportunity for us because he went to uh, Long Reef Car Park. <clears throat> it's about a uh, good 15 minute walk with your board through the bush down the, the cliff face out onto the reef. And then, you know, by the time you paddle out, you get a bit of time. Putting the listening devices in isn't an easy thing. It's virtually giving you approval to steal the car, take it to a place that you can, discreetly pull bits and pieces out, put a listening device in the car. We put a tracking device in as well and then get the car back in the same car parking spot without making it noticeable to the person when he returned. I was uh, down actually, followed him down through the, the cliff face. I was in a pair of boardies, no shirt, just looking like I was a surfer. Walked out to the reef near him. He went out in the surf, I just disappeared back into the, the dune area. I had a radio on me so I could call when he was in or out and luckily enough I called him getting out and they still hadn't got the car back, which was a bit of a worry. Luckily they were finished, ready to put the car back and by the time we had the 15 minute walk back they'd locked the car up and just stepped away from the car as he's coming down to the car park. 
I followed him down and sure enough there was nothing that he uh, noticed. It was different to how he parked the car. Usually what we'll do is photograph everything how it is in situ so when we do put things back you know exactly how it was placed, how it was parked, whether the wheels were turned in, whether the wheels were out. So this got us an advantage now that even though he didn't speak in the car too much, if he did have someone in there like his partner or his kids, he could give us a bit of a heads up on what he was planning on doing. He was a, very much a loner, but the listening device would play an integral part into his arrest in a later scene. With all the surveillance tools in place, Craig and the team were ready to put an end to this reign of terror. Only events didn't transpire exactly as they had imagined. I think it was a Thursday night. I'm actually sure it was a Thursday night because this is his night where he'd go to tech uh, in Ultimo, which was close by to Redfern. Um, we'd followed him before on a Thursday night. He'd do the normal, park his car, go into tech, finish relatively late, 8 o'clock-ish maybe, 8.30, and then drive straight home over the Harbour Bridge. Uh, this particular night was slightly different. Um, we know he hadn't sexually assaulted any woman for about a month and we saw him go through the Sydney CBD area um, over to the other side and for those who aren't familiar with Sydney he went to King's Cross which was renowned for a street prostitution and the area that he was in was exactly that it was William Street William Street run uh, all the way up to King's Cross Coca-Cola sign and uh, we saw him do a lap around Riley Street back into William Street and we gave our monitors a bit of a heads up that something could happen here as he looked like uh, his mannerisms were slightly different he was looking around and sure enough he propped up on the corner in William Street we could only see his actions because we're doing surveillance but from uh, the monitors they relayed that uh, he'd stopped and asked how much for a head job to this uh, street worker and she replied 40 bucks he said jump in so we see the action, she gets in the car, they turn left straight from William Street and then left again into a laneway and from the monitors she was saying, you know, go into this laneway, it's nice and quiet. Um, we knew the area fairly well because, you know, you work in these places all the time and uh, a lot of these little laneways are just dead ends or very quiet so we couldn't actually get there straight in with a car and we had to rely on the monitors who had told us that yes, he'd parked and uh, believe that the car was stationary now. They could hear that the car had stopped. So we had to get someone on foot to try and sneak into a dark corner of the laneway to try and get some visuals on it. These are tense times, you know, you think, what's going on? You've got you know, two minutes of nothing. And uh, sitting in the car, you, you're just intense. I was the team leader at this particular night. Um, we finally get something back from our visual uh, operative in the laneway and, and uh, not that they could see much but they could see the car they could see silhouettes at least one head anyway um, and from the monitors the information came back that they believe she was wearing, um, using a condom uh, which is really important to us because it was more or less giving us a little sack of DNA and then the most important thing was keeping the uh, continuity of the evidence if if she was going to keep it or if she was going to turf, turf it out the window we actually needed to make sure, for evidence sake, that this was the actual condom used by her and it was his semen that was contained in it. Being a little bit light-hearted, even though it's probably not the right time, but when you uh, have been in the cops for 20-something years and you come up against things that aren't normal, you've got to add a little bit of humour to break up that serious side. And I said to everyone, righto, I want everyone to give me your registered numbers. And our registered numbers sort of show your seniority, where you, when you joined and, and whatnot. So everyone's saying, what do you want our registered numbers for? And I said, well, whoever's got the lowest registered numbers can have to go and pick up the semen sample, the condom. A bit of chuckling in between and everyone's trying to give false registered numbers so they're not the junior person. And I said, uh, only joking, whoever's there and doing the visuals, obviously you had to, uh, had to guard that and would get the forensics in if that's what's happened. Sure enough, um, probably 10, 15 minutes later, the job's done and um, our operative in the street says, yes, something's come out the window. So they stayed there. The car was then uh, started up again. Uh, the monitors had told us that they were going to go back to the ATM near where she was picked up and that uh, Kay had said he'll get the money out of the ATM. So he's gone back and, and parked 
right near the ATM. She's got out of the car. He never got out and uh, put his foot on the accelerator and off he went. First left and straight over the bridge. She was left there screaming at him, top of her lungs. You can imagine what she was saying and uh, all the, the gestures in the world with the fingers, etc. He's just taken off, obviously, with a bit of a smirk on his face and uh, off home he went. I made the decision just to send two operatives, which was myself and another, to follow him all the way home while the other four or five stayed at the scene. We had to have the, the same person in the laneway go and guard the, the condom and uh, a couple of the other operatives who so I used a female to go and approach the, the uh, street worker and we wanted to try and find out whether she uh, still had the wrapper for the condom and obviously to uh, hopefully give us evidence in relation to what had happened and she was more than happy. She probably realised how lucky she was as well once we told her that uh, he was a suspect for a number of rapes. She was more than happy to give evidence in regards to anything that would put him away if the DNA came back as, as that. And uh, that's what we did. She ended up coming back to the police station and got a great statement from her with the detectives. Uh, we got the forensics out. They took the sample and it was just a matter of a waiting game then. And uh, it went back to the normal procedures on Friday and everyone's just waiting for this DNA sample, which we knew back in those days would take anywhere between two and four days, could even take longer. So it was business as usual and uh, there was still that excitement in the air that everyone believed this was obviously the, the person who was responsible for these rapes and this was the uh, the breakthrough that we wanted and the detectives at the major crime squad were wrapped and obviously just waiting as well to hear the news from the, uh, the DNA sample. We'd gone through the weekend, he'd done his normal things, he'd been out... Uh, he had a uh, fiancé who he lived with out at Kenthurst. You know, they'd do their normal thing on the weekend, shopping, etc. He had his two boys he'd do things with. It was a long wait. And come to Monday morning, I was at home at the time because I wasn't going to start over at uh, Redfern until just before three. And the boss rang up and said, good news, we've got him. The uh, sample's come back positive. And obviously the, the cheering in amongst all our crew was right there and everyone couldn't wait for that afternoon because that's when he was going to be arrested. The detectives at the Major Crime Squad had indicated to us that they were going to be waiting for him at Kenthurst and uh, all we had to do was follow him home and then they'd take it from there. So it was sort of a, one of these things where you just couldn't wait to get him home so he'd be arrested. He finished work at three o'clock and uh, he headed again over through the city and we thought, what's going on here? He doesn't usually go to that side, he's the North Shore rapist, that's who he is. He headed over to Bondi Junction and uh, our operatives followed him over there. It wasn't long before he had spotted a, a woman walking through the street and obviously took interest. You can see when he took interest in a, a female, his head was like on a swivel stick. And uh, on came the hoodie, parked his car, and out he got with his sunglasses on. So two of our operatives did the normal thing and parked their car, and off they went following him. He obviously had his eye on this particular woman. We called, you know, who she was and what she was wearing. So the operatives knew exactly who it was, and his pace definitely quickened up to get towards her. And just as he was approaching her, one of our operatives had had enough and there was no need for him to lay a hand on her. He's come up, got his uh, gun out of his undercover holster and came up to Kay and said, put your hands on your head, he said, and get to your knees. Kay looked around really slowly and obviously realised at the time what was going on. He had no idea we'd been following him for all this time. As I said, everyone was just so sick of this bloke by this time. Kay got down on his hands and knees and uh, he was handcuffed. We uh, took the uh, female who kept walking in front away and explained what had happened. Um, as you can guess, she was just so appreciative that you know she wasn't touched, and there was, as I said, there was no reason for him to touch her. Everyone was at that point. This was a great arrest, even though the detectives were still waiting back at Kenthurst. It had to be done. There was no reason whatsoever for any other woman to suffer from this guy. The North Shore rapist Graham Kay was arrested and held for trial. In July 2000, he was sentenced to 20 years behind bars. Although Craig is about to be thrust into the more dangerous underworld of professional criminals and corrupt police, 
This case remains one of his most professionally satisfying. Craig reflects. One important thing, you know, I've been, I was in the police for 25 years, but this is a one-off case that most times when you do arrest a rapist or someone with sexual offences, it's after you've found out the DNA and that they've been linked to the DNA or the witness or the victim knows the offender. This is a one-off. I, I wouldn't say there's many in the world where you actually find the offender and you haven't been able to prove it, but you spend a month watching him and watching him prey on women and seeing his antics and uh, watching this guy who was just extremely cold and you can see why the offence carries such a harsh penalty because the action of him and what he does to women was despicable and no woman should have to go through that threat of violence and as an operative you know it, watching him do it was as I said it was a hard thing to watch for us, it's extremely hard to do what we do. You've got to be a hidden shadow. You've got to mix in with the environment. Because once he's spooked, and if he is spooked, you lose everything, the advantage that you have. To follow someone, it's extremely hard. People see it on movies and etc. It's extremely hard process to follow someone and be unseen and get that close to them, which we had to do. We had to remain close. We had, uh, you know, some of our cars, we, we use old cars. We don't use uh, undercover cars that are current, that people see detectives drive. We were in, you know, 15-year-old cars, old panel vans with curtains and surfboards on and old Holden Rodeo utes, etc. Um, they're not the most reliable cars. They do break down and these are all the contingency plans you've got to put up with. Again, you know, like when he jumps out of a car, you could have operatives there ready to go and ready to arrest in case something does happen. People have got to think on their feet, and you've got to be a lateral thinker when you do this sort of work. But this sort of job, this was a one-off, and we knew at the time we were doing it, it was very special, and everyone on board wanted to get a result. I mentioned about putting some of the police women in a situation, which is hard for them as well. They've got to rely on the fact that we're going to be there close by. The reason that didn't work was it was hard getting a police woman in front of him because we have to actually try and work out where he's going to go. I'm sure he didn't know where he was going to go, he'd get in his car and just drive. So to try and get a police operative in front of him, in situ, and for him to look in that direction and actually for her to appeal to him was another hard thing. We tried that a number of times but failed with that, with that style of operation for, for him to try. The successful arrest of Graham John Kay had attracted the attention of Craig's superiors. He was almost immediately transferred to the New South Wales State Major Incident Group. He was about to be thrust deep into Australia's criminal underworld. You know, we had a fair bit of paperwork, but it was virtually one or two days later, I went back into the office and uh, the boss called me in and said, uh, I want you to head over to the State Major Incident Group. We've got something going over there and they've requested three of us and I want you and two others to go over. So I knew the area well in the, the city. It was a, an office right in the middle of the city that housed a lot of the uh, police and on the very top floor was the state major incident group and I was going back there I didn't know at the time what it was I knew it was going to be a, a big job and it was um, a closed shop which means there wasn't any information until I got there and briefed and usually you've got to sign a, uh, a confidentiality agreement um, so it was going to be intriguing and uh, that's where I headed off. In episode two of Conviction Craig finds himself shadowing two hard-nosed professional criminals who have set up operations in Sydney to escape the heat in Melbourne. We relive the surveillance of these drug lords and at the same time learn the subtle difference between perfume and methamphetamine.